Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this beautiful day, for an opportunity to pause from the work and the worries of this week, to refresh our souls and our bodies with the fellowship of one another, but most of all, our fellowship with you. We thank you, Father, for an opportunity to worship you, to delight in you, to spend a whole day enjoying you. And we pray, Father, that this evening you would again refresh us, that as we consider the sound words that have been handed down to us as we sweep through this vast work that is our inheritance and legacy, we pray, Father, that we would cherish the truths that are found here, that we would submit it to the superiority of the Scriptures, that we would indeed tonight see our Jesus and be in awe of Him. We pray that tonight our minds would be sharp and clear to think aright your thoughts after you, that our hearts would be enlarged, that we might love and serve you more faithfully, and that this week we might bear good fruit and bring you glory in our relationships. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are on the final lecture of our Westminster Confession of Faith study, a review. Have any of you climbed mountains? I mean, okay, white mountains count. <laughs> they don't have to be Rockies, but if you've climbed that, you get bonus points. Um, when you get to the top of a mountain, what's like the first thing you guys do? Look at the view, look, at the view, look around, see the scenery. The first thing I do is I like try to find where I started. And I'm like leaning over and I'm looking down and I'm like, where did I come from? How did I get up here? I may be unique in that oddity. That the first thing I want to see, the thing I want to figure out is, now that I've ascended to this great height, where did I begin from and how did I get there? So that's the roadmap for tonight. It's sort of the idea of we have over the last one year and, I didn't count, uh, four months, I figured somebody would know. Yeah, one year and four months, we have walked paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter through the Westminster Confession of Faith. And now here we are at the end, and I, and I want to try and bring 33 chapters together. And I've done that. You have the outline there in front of you. Um, and I wanted to try and present something of, of the path we've been on. Where we began, our starting point is the Word of God, chapter 1 that God speaks into the world and he makes things known to us. When God speaks to us, he reveals, first of all, himself. God speaks about himself. In the first five chapters of the Westminster Confession of Faith are all based on what we call theology, theology proper, the study of God, knowing him. We have the idea that he's revealed as Trinity. What's Trinity? Okay, three persons in one God. What's a person? No, I'm kidding. Um, there are three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then we also understand that while these are three persons in one, he is also a God who makes decrees. That is a God who has purpose, a God who makes decisions and acts, a God who exerts his will. He is not passive in his relationship, but rather, and we talked about this when we looked at this chapter, but I get excited about these things, so I go back to them again. It is the love of God that moves him. He is a God who loves, who decides and who acts because he wants to express his glory, his holiness. He's not content, above all things, ironically, to be a deist. He himself could never be a deist. He doesn't like leaving things alone. He loves investing in things. So he has a purpose, and he acts upon that purpose. That purpose, in the next chapters, are then expressed in his works. And what are the two works of God? Creation and providence. He is both a maker and a caretaker. He creates something and he doesn't leave it alone. He takes care of it. In this way, Westminster begins with these five chapters in giving us a snapshot of what the Word tells us 
about God, who he is, what he does, and how he does it. Does that make sense? It lays out for us this framework of theology. And so, by the way, all of these headings, I, I found it fun to go through the confession and draw up these headings and realize that they're actually the headings that were used in my uh, systematic theology classes in seminary. So doctrine of God, doctrine of human nature, doctrine of the church, doctrine of end times. I actually didn't take that class. I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I think it turned out okay. Um, this doctrine of theology is our foundation and our cornerstone. So there is this one chapter, the revelation of God, from which these other four are born, this theology of God. I kind of really want to ask this question this way, but are there any questions about God? I, I mean the first five chapters of Westminster. I have a question. Why do they begin here? Foundation. Yeah, what's the one important thing you want in a foundation of a house? You don't want it to move. The single most important thing in a house's foundation is that it not move, unless you live in Japan. Then you want it to move, like on wheels. But on the whole, buildings do better with a lack of momentum, yes? Um, they do better with stability. Likewise, our theology, what we believe about the world and how we live our lives in the world, do best when we lay it on a solid foundation, on something that does not move. Now, in all of creation, notice the trick question there. In all of creation, what's the one thing that never moves? God, the God who creates, the God who sustains creation and holds it up. So this is why we begin here with God, okay? The next thing Westminster moves on to is humanity. So having considered God, we now consider humans. Why are humans the things that we consider after God? We're made in his image. So in a very real sense, we're the next step down, right? So in the uh, great chain, you know, the golden chain of being from the medieval ages, you know, there's God, there's heavenly beings, and then there's us. But more importantly, we are made in his image that is within the created order in the things that we may know and understand. We are the things closest to God in morality, in ethic, in image bearing. Why else would humans come next? What could be more relevant? We're, so important. <laughs> We're at least important to ourselves in the sense of we have to know who we are. There, there's a, a conversation we can have about our relationship to creation. And there's a conversation that we can have about our relationship to God and our relationship to each other. But we do have to kind of start with defining the I. So one of the areas where Descartes went really wrong, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, is he hasn't defined I. He needs to start by defining I. But to define I, you need something more permanent than self. Hence, Westminster doesn't follow Descartes and starts with God, something more permanent. So when we look at humans, the first thing we have to consider about humans is what? Yeah. See, it's a funny thing. We do have to acknowledge that we were created good. But how many chapters of the Bible are before the fall and how many chapters are after? You have to know how many chapters there are in the Bible. Yeah, so there are two before the fall. There are 1,187 after the fall. Well, 1,186. It depends if you count the fall, you know, chapter 3. But... The preponderance of God's revelation to us comes after the fall and grows out of the significance of this event in Genesis chapter 3. And so there's a problem with humans. They have fallen into sin and misery. We are deserving of curse and of punishment. And so upon this theology, Westminster begins to extend principles. We also have hope. 
In the next chapter, Westminster talks about God's covenant with man, that God graciously does not abandon his creation to its destruction, to its self-destruction, but rather God graciously binds himself. Remember that comment about God's decrees and why it's important? That God is invested in his creation. He is willing to pursue it and to bring it back from the brink. And he does so by a redeemer, the next chapter in Westminster. By sending a redeemer, by sending his own son in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who serves as the mediator between God and man, reconciling humanity and divinity, not just in his work. We often focus on that and rightly. He dies on the cross, bringing peace between God and man. But he also reconciles us in his own flesh. For while he is of a full human nature, he is also of a full divine nature. And then thirdly, it's interesting, we have liberty. Westminster here speaks of the human will and its relative freedom. Now, of course, we cannot mean absolute freedom, the sense that the human can do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. Climbing out of second story windows, you cannot fly. You, just, you can't do it. No matter how much you will, and like, have you guys seen the movie Hook? That's like really dating me, but. Um, so thinking happy thoughts is not going to get you any higher off the ground. Happy thoughts are great, but they don't overcome gravity. They just don't. And so we have a liberty to follow what is consistent in our nature, just like God. And so within this, we have the full scope of humanity. We have the prospect of greatness in our relationship with God. We have the ruin in our departure from God. We have God joining us in our humanity in order to redeem us. We have the freedom that we exercise according to be our own creature, to be a true creature according to our consistency. This, by the way, shapes itself into something of our counseling conversation. We should be able to encourage one another. It's not okay to be sinful. It is okay to be human. It's okay to be weak and it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be human. We exercise within our own character and limits. So in this, we have an encapsulation of the doctrine of humans and who they are. Any questions or comments on that section of the confession? So we begin by looking, doctrine of God. We now look at the doctrine of humanity. What does it mean to be human? And then Westminster enters into what is really the bulk of its work. What does it mean to be saved? By the way, the fun words that we picked up is theology, anthropology, and soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, what we believe, soteriology. Soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, begins with effectual calling. Now notice that the chapter on effectual calling immediately follows the chapter on free will. Why is that? What is the relationship between the human's free will and effectual calling? <laughs> At least in this sense, what, I, what I'm meaning is free will can't do it, effectual calling does. The idea that the chapter on free will establishes and states clearly we cannot will ourselves into a state of grace. And yet in the very next chapter, it says, but rather the Holy Spirit must draw us. The Spirit must do what our will cannot. And so salvation begins in this way with effectual calling, the Holy Spirit drawing us to himself. Does anyone know what the benefits are of effectual calling? It's from the Shorter Catechism. Yeah, I'll give you a hint. They're listed there on your page, in, right in the middle. The benefits of effectual calling in this life are justification, adoption, sanctification, and others which either accompany or flow from these three. If you go to a later question, it'll ask you, what are the three, what are those that benefits that accompany or flow from these three? And they are increase of grace, perseverance to the end, assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, the things that we see here, the good works. 
And joy in the Holy Spirit. Very good. Did not mean to skip that one. <laughs> we have all of these riches and wealth of salvation, but notice something important. I was having this conversation just a couple weeks ago with a member of the church. When we speak of justification, we are using a legal description of salvation, not something wholly distinct from adoption, which is rather a familial description of salvation. There is one cohesive salvation. We do not speak of possessing justification and lacking adoption. They are one, and they are bound up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We likewise experience sanctification over our lifetime, but it is one with our justification and our adoption. They are bound up together as a complete package in Christ. Saving faith, repentance, good works, perseverance, and assurance likewise proceed from our union with Christ. That within his person and within his work, we find the completeness of salvation. So it's important that when we look at Westminster in these chapters, that we do not lose sight of the fact that these details, critically essential to our understanding, our right understanding of salvation, are not meant to be wholly different and are not meant to be divorced or held separately, but rather to be seen as an organic whole, a different way of looking at the same experience. So when we come to those troublesome passages in Peter, where he says, your obedience cleanses you. And we go, no, 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 Christ's obedience cleanses me. We step back and say, well, let's reread the chapter on good works. He is not speaking of justification. He is speaking of the Christian experience that our life becomes progressively pure as we become progressively obedient. It is rather a description of the Christian experience, not the heart of salvation and justification. Similarly, assurance. Westminster is very good and pastoral about laying out for us the rocky road to assurance. And the idea that faith waxes and wanes, but a certainty in Christ need not, that the surety of Christ need not. So this then is our doctrine of salvation. Sorry, I didn't write any notes. It's at the bottom of the board. So any questions or thoughts on the doctrine of salvation? So we're ascending up. We're starting with our theology. We know who God is and how he's working in the world. We know who are, we are and what role we're playing in the story. Now we've looked at what Jesus has done in the objective experience of salvation. Notice what comes next on its heels. Well, what happens to Israel when they're brought up out of Egypt? They go to the law. After that moment, I, I can't write down there anymore. After the liberty and salvation that comes to the people of God, they go to Mount Sinai and they are given the commands of God, the duty of all humanity to obey the law of God. And that is the next chapter. That out of our justification, adoption, sanctification, out from our faith, repentance, good works, perseverance, and assurance, we then receive or are in a position to receive the standards for living and how God would have us walk in this world, the law of God. It is interesting to me that the next chapter then is Christian liberty and liberty of conscience. For we must never mistake the law of government nor a fellow man with the law of God. There is liberty in the Christian to be bound forever to the law of God. That's what Christian liberty really is. It is defined as the freedom to obey God. But similarly, the liberty of the conscience is the freedom to resist the will and authority of humans who are violating the law of God. That we have a liberty in Christ to always keep the law of God, even in defiance of those who would oppose it. And then similarly, we have before us the religious worship and the Sabbath day, the superiority of God's claim over our time, 
over our loyalties, over our week and our energy and our talent. This is the Christian duty. I don't necessarily need to spend a whole lot of time on this section because you guys heard a sermon this morning on that. <laughs> that God has called us to a full obedience and complete devotion to him, a thoroughgoing loyalty. So this is humanity's duty. So as we're weaving our way through, you guys see the progression? The progression of thought here as it goes through. Any thoughts on duty, on the law of God? Any questions? It goes a lot quicker without all the troublemakers, huh? Next, Westminster looks at human communities. In some ways, I wrestled with how to lay this out as a map. In some ways, this is a parallel concept to the human problem, to the human hope, to the human duty. But in a lot of ways, it is actually a continuation of the human duty. That not only do we have obligation, what you really see in the first three chapters there, the law of God, Christian liberty, liberty of the conscience, religious worship and Sabbath, is really something of a presentation of the first table of the law, the first four commandments, yes? Then this, the next section that I'm calling a human community are really a focus on the next series, the, the second table of the law, uh, commandments five through 10. And it begins fascinatingly with oaths and vows. And I would not have instinctively considered that to be the cornerstone chapter or the first chapter of human relationships, except that I've been doing a lot of reading on human relationships in the last couple of months, learning how to be like a decent human being and live with you people. Um, just kidding. And uh, what is fascinating is to realize that in book after book after book, they do point out how important oaths and vows are to human relationships. How many of you are in a relationship that began with an oath or a vow? How many of you realize that your relationships that contain some level of oath or vow actually outnumbers the relationships that are not? When you think about church membership, when you think about marriage, when you think about parenting, when you think about employment, there's at least an implicit sense of let your yes be yes and your no be no. There is something you are promising to exchange. There is a reality that as humans, what we verbally express to one another is the cornerstone of our relationship. What we commit and then deliver to each other is the, where our relationships grow and blossom. What I found fascinating about this kind of symmetry is what is in fact the first act of God with us in creation? It's chapter one of the Westminster Confession of Faith. He speaks. Our relationship with God begins with him communicating. I had a professor at Geneva College um, and he would begin, oh no, you had him too. <laughs> and he would always begin class. He'd start in and go, communication begins in the spirit. And I would just sit there and go, what does that mean? Like, what are you talking about? And finally, as he un, un, you know, unfolded the class and developed his theology, I began to realize he was speaking, communication begins in the spirit this way. I was assuming human spirit, that the communication begins inside me and it comes welling up or some sort of you know, metaphysical thing. He meant capital S. Communication begins with the Holy Spirit. That God in his love has proceeding from him, inspirating from him communication. And the Holy Spirit hovers over the waters as soon as God says, let there be. That when God speaks, his spirit proceeds from there. And humans made in his image have a similar nature. That our relationships proceed from our words. Have you ever considered the words, I love you? And what they mean to people. If you're a male, yes, you have. Because you generally don't like saying them very much. And then you realize you have to say them. 
And then there's this realization that relationships grow from our words. The first relationship that they look at is civil, the civil magistrate. The idea that we live in a society that must be ordered with authority and peace. That our oaths and vows must mean something in society. Then it moves to marriage and divorce. We have a relationship with the community around us and a relationship with one another in marriage, in the family. Moving from the broad spheres of society, yes, I'm using that word on purpose, if any of you have read Kuiper, that we move from the broad spheres of society, the sphere of family, to specifically the church. Notice how not Dutch Westminster is. The civil sphere gets one chapter. The family sphere gets one chapter. And most of it's actually just focused on marriage and, and, and divorce, not on parenting. And then how many chapters are on the church? That's very Scottish. To, to have that emphasis within the Reformed tradition, I'm saying. There, it's very Scottish to have that emphasis on the church, to focus on that as Christ's leading instrument in human existence and civilization to bring about his ends. The church then has within it or under it, so marriage, and then we'll cover church. Under the church, we cover then these different aspects, the communion of saints. That is the fellowship that we have in common. Notice that the chapter is begun and focused again on this human community idea, that the church is fundamentally a communion, a community of saints. That unity, that fellowship is expressed primarily in sacraments, baptism, the Lord's Supper. But interestingly enough, if you read a bunch of guys on community, including the secular people, they'll actually point out something evangelicals have been loath to do. Discipline. Even the pagans and the secularists will say human communities cannot survive if they do not self-discipline. You must have boundaries in order to be a cohesive unit. There must be an in and there must be an out. Otherwise, you're, you're amorphous. You, you, you don't exist. You're not defined. Human communities must be something and something, and, and something that it is not. There are Baileys, right? And you know which ones here are Baileys. And the boundaries are not always crystal clear, right? There are Hallidays. There are Finleys. You can tell them apart. It, there's a distinction here. And yet, the boundary of the church exists within its discipline, its ability to affect its own identity in the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then those who are entrusted with the responsibility to administer those sacraments, to preserve that communion through discipline, the synods, the councils, the church officers are presented to us. So in this way, we have the full breadth of human experience. Are there any questions about that? the chapters on human relationships or community, or any comments? Yes, Kyle. Just out of curiosity, you mentioned that this is very Scottish history. Yes. How would that differ from the Dutch? Question? Yeah, so the Dutch, the Kuyperian school, you're going to have within these three, you know, your, your sphere and your sphere sovereignty, and my circles are really bad, but Kuypers would be equal. So Kuiper would advocate for equal attention to all three spheres, that the state is no less a critical instrument in the kingdom of God, that the family is no less a critical instrument in the, in the kingdom of God. The more, not just Scottish, but British tradition of the Reformed theology has said, yes, he is king of the, of the, of the state. Yes, he is king of the home but Christ's primary instrument in the world to affect his kingdom and bring about his will is the church. And so she receives a, a sort of preeminence among the three spheres.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, one of the theological foundations for this parody is the belief that common grace is as effective and valuable as special grace. So common grace being the operations of the spirit among all humans everywhere. Um, special grace, or yeah, special grace being the unique operations of the Holy Spirit unto salvation. And so within the Dutch tradition, there's sort of, not universally, but certainly with Kuiper, this um, holding of the Spirit's operations being all equal all the time. And so common grace among the pagan unbelievers, just as good as special grace in the believer when it comes to civil sphere issues or familial issues. I read way too much Dutch in undergrad. (laughs) Good question. Thank you. And then the last part. Where does Westminster end? At the end. With eschatology. So we begin with our theology. We move to our anthropology. We go to our soteriology. Um... Then to piety, I had to remember what words I came up with. I don't have them in my notes. Piety, uh, duty to God, human community. Community was the word I came up with. And then eschatology, the end of the world, how it will go about. Notice once again, there is not a large chunk of time spent on this. There are two fairly brief chapters, death, resurrection, and judgment. There is not a preoccupation with the end of the world. If this was being done in evangelicalism in the 20th century, there probably would have been a lot more time spent on this. But it wasn't so. Written at the time in the mid-1600s, there was a general agreement among Christians about death, resurrection, and judgment. But what is more, there was an understanding that the scriptures spoke simply, briefly, and clearly on the matter. And that there wasn't, indeed, as much about it as we had wished or would develop in the 20th century. So Westminster then has this progression. Notice that it begins with God speaks. And it ends with God judges. And within, it spends the bulk of its time focused on people. How they live together. How they please God. How they get saved. It's a very humanistic document. That's the reason I use the language here. Humanity's problem, humanity's hope, humanity's duty, humanity's community, and humanity's future. It is something born out of the movement of the Reformations and Renaissance of its time. Very much preoccupied with what is God doing with people? What does he want of people? In fact, when Westminster goes in its shorter catechism to sum up the full teaching of Scripture, can you imagine that for a moment? What? Do the scriptures principally teach? What man is to believe about God and what God wants us to do. What we should know about who he is and what we should know about how we should treat him and what we should treat, do with one another. This becomes the framework for human doctrine. What we believe is bound up in belief about God and belief about people. So this then frames a lot of theological conversations. I'll pick on one. The problem of evil. Where does evil come from? The only biblical answer is your sinful heart. Because outside of the human experience, the scriptures does not address the origins of evil. And there are numerous other theological gangways and roads and bridges into all sorts of curiosities that need to be fit into this framework that taken as a whole what Westminster is presenting is not a hodgepodge of random beliefs but rather a collective system of doctrine pointing us to the primacy and superiority of God that we begin by knowing him where do you think they got that from Starts with an I, ends with institutes. (laughs) Chapter one of John Calvin's Institutes, the sum of all human knowledge is in knowing God and knowing self. We cannot know ourselves until we know God and we cannot know God until we know ourselves. And that paradigm appears here in Westminster. We must know God and know him first. 
But then we must know who we are as image bearers under God. In this way, the confession takes on a lively power in our lives. To confess. I had to look the word up. Anyone know what it means to confess? What does confess mean in your home? Yeah, you admit. Yeah, very good. You admit, you acknowledge, you say, when, when, when you do something wrong and you confess, you're admitting it, you're acknowledging it, you're saying that is true. And that's precisely what this confession is meant to do. To say these things are true. I acknowledge them. I admit them. It's from the Latin. The fesso, it means to declare, to vow, to pledge. It actually has a legal Roman sensibility. The idea is that you pledge yourself at cost. It is what we would say, right hand on the Bible, you know, raise, or left hand on your Bible, right hand raised. I solemnly swear this is true. And I will stake my life on it. I will bet my life on it. Is this how we feel about the Westminster Confession of Faith? These things are so. Del Tackett developed an entire system of uh, worldview study things based around this question. Do what you believe is true? Do you really believe it to be true? Do we really believe this? Do we declare, vow, pledge to the world that at cost and with conviction, we will be accountable for these truths, to live them and to declare them. Any other thoughts? Yes. Um, it strikes me that there's certain implications here to start with Scripture. Um, and it's the fact that what we know about God is what he reveals. Um, and that besides that, we don't know. And so there's, a lot, there's always lots of questions that we can ask about, you know, As that other Dutchman said, I do not know God as he is. I know him as he reveals himself to be. Yeah, I don't know if uh, anybody knows the um, Conan and Donan YouTube videos on the Trinity (laughs) with Patrick, where uh, so they have um, these little cartoons, and Patrick, the uh, the Irish saint, shows up and he wants to explain. You know, they're like we're just poor Irish, you know, farmers, and Chris knows a few of these guys, and. uh, Can you explain the Trinity to us in simple terms? And he starts using all the metaphors that you guys have heard, you know, the egg and the water and the clover and so on. And and every time he goes to explain the Trinity in one of these metaphors, they interrupt him and go, oh, no, Patrick, that's this heresy. That's that heresy. And and they just label all his metaphors heresies. Um, And they do it in extravagant uh, fake Irish accents. Um, And uh, as they do it, They get to the end, and finally the Irish character is frustrated. He has a very thick Midwestern American accent, ironically. And um, he gets to the end, and he says, you know, all right, here's the deal. It is a mystery that cannot be comprehended and is best confessed in the Athanasian Creed. And then he recites the Creed. And it's like, exactly. We cannot improve on the orthodox truths that have been handed down. 
and it is good to retain and not re-debate those issues. And yet it becomes a document of its time as well, that it has to handle the issues. And we looked a little bit, bit about those, some of the language about the civil magistrate where you're like, ah, that's right, because parliament and the king are right now fighting each other. <laughs> Makes sense. I just want to It is fascinating that Westminster's ambition at the time was to bring unity among the British churches, the English, the Irish, and the Scottish churches. And at the time, it failed. The English did not sign on. Only the Reformed Presbyterians, for a season, publicly affirmed this document. Um, and yet today, chiefly through Ulster Scots, Scotch-Irish immigration in the uh, 18th century, there are more subscribers to the Westminster Confession of Faith today than there were total population in the United Kingdom at the time. It's, you know, it's, it's this marvelous faithfulness of God that he's preserved a document for this long and increased the amount of unity that it has brought because it didn't bring a whole lot at the time. I would argue through no fault of its own. <laughs> yes. Yes. Added to Westminster would be a tricky thing. We'd have to rename it. Because it would, yeah. No, no, it's, I think it's a very good question. Um, on the one hand, what, what it would lead me to be, to, to argue is, I like our practice of testimony, where we can add subsequent comment without altering the original document. Um, this is partly my historical bias. I'm not a huge fan of the American Revision of 1788 because now we're calling a historical document by the same name and it's not the same document. That's not historically honest. I'm just saying that but, we were writing today. Yeah, I think that um, one area that, again, to make it a document of its time that we would need to address is anthropology more thoroughly. Even though they have all this work on human nature, it's great. <laughs> But sort of the essence of human nature in the image of God is something we desperately need to recover, as expressed in gender, as expressed in offices in the church, in the relationship between those two themes. Um, these are critically hot issues right now for which Westminster does not give us a lot of theological foundation to work with. They do give us the basic premise, we are male and female in the image of God. But to fully develop that as we as a synod have done in two documents now. I mean, in a sense, the idea that we have produced two synodical level pamphlets on these issues sort of demonstrates there's a need for a confessional statement on at least that issue. Yes. So, uh, what is it? It's um, one on, yeah, there's one on gender identity and there's one on transgenderism. Is that right? No, I'm sorry, sexual orientation and gender identity. The first one is sexual orientation and the second one is gender identity. Both drafted by committees of synod and adopted by synod and published by Crown and Covenant. And again, I was careful with my wording. I don't know that we need to be in the weeds of making a confessional statement that sorts out all the details and applications of those issues, but rather, as Westminster did in its time, elevating the debate and making theological assertions that are then things you can hang, you know, hook a hat on and, and say, because of this truth, 
such things may be deduced or applied. Anything else? Well, then I'll close this with a word of prayer. And let's sing from Psalm 119M. Psalm 119M. Any guesses as to what is studied in that psalm selection? Yeah, how I love your law. It is my study all the day. Yeah. So uh, as much as we study the Westminster Confession of Faith, which we will not do for, I don't know, several more years, um, much more, Psalm 111, we should study the works of God. Psalm 119, we should study the word of God. So let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this confession you have given us. We pray that we would be faithful to stand fast and to uphold it, to manifest it in our lives. We pray, Father, that we would always submit it to your works and to your word, that we would be faithful students of you, who you are, and what you are doing in our world. Father, have mercy on us that even this week we would give ourselves generously and sacrificially to knowing you and living to the praise of your name. Father, have mercy on us tonight and give us safe travels home and a week of joy and service to you. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Psalm 119, Selection M.